All moral beings have essentially the same rights and duties, whether they be male or female. If we women have no right to act, then we may well be termed the white slaves of the North. For like our brethren in bonds, we must seal our lips in silence and despair. Angelina Grimke, 1837. In the early years after the United States was founded, America was a promised land for some. They came with empty pockets, worked hard, bought land, built businesses. They had more say in their government than people of any other country in the world. They lived in a democracy, but more than half of America did not. Women, African Americans, and poor men of every race. This is the story of their struggle to be included. The work of the American revolutionaries and the writers of the Constitution broke traditions and raised eyebrows. Their call for reform was heard around the world. But now the country was moving on from its infancy to its childhood. America had become a different place than the America that George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin knew. Could their democracy survive? Could the American government deliver on the promises contained in the Declaration of Independence and the preamble of the Constitution? Americans spent the early 1800s conquering the wilderness. They strung the countryside with railroad tracks and built a network of canals and roads, transporting people and products quickly and efficiently from farm to city, from region to region. Let us then bind the Republic together with a perfect system of roads and canals. Let us conquer space. John Calhoun, 1821. For some, growing businesses meant homes were filled with inexpensive machine-made goods, closets were filled with clothes, and time was set aside for rest and play. More and more things that had never been available before are being bought. Households have store-bought clothing, store-bought furniture, store-bought food of various kinds, store-bought drink of all kinds of descriptions. And the household became a unit of consumption instead of a unit of production. And it began to resemble what we normally think of a modern household. But for others, industrialization meant danger. While trade is destined to free and employ the masses, it is also destined to destroy, for the time, much of the beauty and happiness of every land. We are free, but the excitement, the commercial activity, the restlessness to which the state of affairs has given birth is far from being a desirable or natural condition. Henry W. Bellows, 1845. America was changing. How were the American cities changing in the first half of the 1800s? Well, they were growing like mushrooms. They were teeming with new immigrants and people coming in from the countryside. One of the things that began to happen in cities at this point is there were more people in them, is that people began to see poverty in ways that they hadn't before. Violence, people drinking too much alcohol, children wandering in the streets, homeless people. These aren't modern problems. These were the problems that came with the first great period of rapid urbanization. And immigrants were particularly different because they were coming from Ireland and from Germany, mostly in the first half of the 1800s. The arrival of those peoples who spoke different languages was difficult for most Americans to deal with. We have a problem today, I think, uh, dealing with people who are different. And uh, that's not new. It really began in the middle of the 19th century. What was happening to America? Was the American experiment failing? People started lifting their voices, demanding change. 
America had never seen a party like this before. Incoming President Andrew Jackson actually threw open the doors of the White House to an unruly mob that muddied the carpets, broke dishes, and stood on the furniture to catch a glimpse of the new president. People pushed and shoved to get a closer look at Jackson, who was forced to spend his first night in office in a nearby hotel. Jackson's inauguration day in 1829 became a symbol of the growing political power of the common man, an idea that delighted some and scared others. Although the Constitution begins with, we the people, it wasn't always clear who the people were. Women and African Americans were excluded, but so were many white men. America uh, did not begin as a democracy, as is commonly believed. There were property qualifications in every state um, after the American Revolution, so that uh, one had to own property in order to vote in most states. A growing number of Americans argued that this wasn't fair, that the poor should have a voice too. There are various ways in which the rich may oppress the poor, in which property may oppress liberty, and that the world is filled with examples. It is necessary that the poor should have a defense against the danger. James Madison, 1820. Unlike Madison, most of the Founding Fathers had feared the common man and built in means to limit who could vote, including the requirement of land ownership. But all of that was changing in the 1820s. Andrew Jackson was a self-made man. He was born on a frontier in Tennessee. He was an orphan, in fact, poor, poor as a church mouse, um, who rose within the military became a very successful soldier in the War of 1812. Old Hickory, they called him, tough as the hardest wood. He was fearless, rough and tumble, and had a violent temper, a different kind of leader than Americans were used to. He wasn't afraid to wear muddy shoes into the White House um, and uh, belt down uh, shots of whiskey with the shabbiest looking uh, person who might come down the street. So he, was, he typified the common man and Americans loved him. And he spoke for the farmers and frontiersmen, particularly in the South and West. When Jackson became president in 1829, he fought hard against the established United States government, headed by what he called professional politicians, eating at the hog trough, and taking rights away from the American people. He argued for states' rights and for less federal government. To curb special influence, he removed hundreds of federal office holders and killed the Bank of the United States, which he thought was favoring businessmen and politicians he called money power. Many of our rich men have not been content with equal protection and equal benefits, but have besought us to make them richer by act of Congress. Andrew Jackson. Jackson's bold use of presidential power won him many enemies and the nickname King Andrew I from opponents who thought he was acting like a king instead of a president. These opponents formed the Whig Party, a name used by English politicians who had fought against the abuses of the king. Swept by controversy, Andrew Jackson's presidency became the symbol of political changes that were sweeping the nation. A movement developed uh, to extend the vote, partly through agitation on the part of people who want men who wanted the vote, and partly on the part of reformers who thought that the, the nation should fulfill its, um, its democratic destiny. So after 1815 or so, and into the 1840s, state after state after state rewrites its constitution. And in rewriting its constitution, generally speaking, more and more men gain the right to vote. In other words, property qualifications are eliminated. On the other hand, no women were being able to vote, and this increased the distinction between women and men. Because before there had been all women and some men who couldn't vote, and now suddenly all white men could vote and no women could vote. As white men, poor white men, were gaining the vote, free black men in America were losing the vote. They had voted in most of the northern states, but in the 1820s and 30s and 40s, the northern states were revising their constitutions and stripping away the right of free African Americans to vote. That reflected the growing racial tension in the north, 
between free blacks and free whites. Many Americans questioned their government on these inequalities and in other areas of life. Hand in hand with political change came new ways of thinking about religion, slavery, alcohol, hospitals, orphanages, and the role of women. There were temperance societies trying to combat alcoholism. There were women's suffrage societies. There were prison societies to try to improve the conditions of the prison. There were societies to provide more humane treatment for the insane. There were societies to attend to racial conflict and so forth. It was a great year of reform. These movements brought together unlikely friends, preachers and slaves, former drunkards and school teachers, rich and poor, all with a burning desire for change. One of the first places they looked for national salvation was through the salvation of their own souls. One evening, when T. Dewey was exhorting, a flash of forked lightning pierced the air and rolling thunder seemed to shake the house. Some screeched out for mercy. Some jumped out of windows and, and others ran out the door. From this night, the stir became visible and 13 of the youth that night resolved together to pursue religion. Lorenzo Dow, 1804. Traveling the back roads from Canada to Mississippi, Methodist minister Lorenzo Dow preached sermons of fire and brimstone in churches, homes, tents, and open fields. Camp meetings, they called them. The thousands who attended were part of a second great awakening that swept American cities and frontiers in the early 1800s. People were concerned with salvation, with whether they would be saved after death. Um, more and more, uh, this question loomed larger in the lives of people who were trying to deal with wrenching social changes. And this was not a small issue. I mean, if you really, this is an age of ardent belief in eternal afterlife. And so, facing damnation is not a trivial matter. It's forever, right? And you're not, you can't be a little wrong in religion. You're either right or you're damned and people would get very, very um, wrought up about this. Camp meetings became the way large numbers of people gathered in order to profess their faith in Jesus Christ and seek salvation for their souls. Followers of Lorenzo Dow and others who were filled with religious devotion sought to reform themselves and their society. They believed they could revive the Republic by getting closer to God. They were really aimed at getting people to inspect their own souls and to have a kind of uh, rebirth, a kind of awakening, a spiritual awakening that would allow them to feel at peace and saved and sure and that they were perfectible, that they could in fact reform themselves. It was a message that reached from the poorest Americans to the most powerful politicians. Man can be elevated. Man can become more and more endowed with divinity. And as he does, he becomes more godlike in his character and capable of governing himself. Andrew Jackson, 1828. Women played important roles in church congregations, and a growing number sought to be official leaders. Jarena Lee, an African-American woman born in Philadelphia, believed God had called her to preach in her African Methodist Episcopal Church. Her pastor encouraged her to work and pray, but would not ordain her. In other churches, women could not speak or pray publicly when men were present. Facing these roadblocks, many women formed their own organizations and ministered to people through abolition, women's rights causes, anti-lynching crusades, and teaching. Would they bring heaven to earth? If they were to do so, the first thing they would have to eliminate was the scourge of demon rum. I have just heard that my cousin Grange Owen is in Rochester jail for ill treatment of his wife and family. 
his wife having made a legal complaint. He refuses to get bail or give bonds for his future good conduct. I am satisfied that his conduct is bad and insufferable. It is caused in part by his drinking rum. Calvin Owen, Penfield, New York. Rum and whiskey were cheap and plentiful in the early 1800s. Many Americans considered it healthful and nutritious. It's hard to exaggerate, really, the level of drinking in the early republic. Uh, it was a part of everybody's life. Women drank, children drank, men drank, everybody drank. Um, most of it was low-grade alcohol, but nevertheless, people drank an enormous amount, largely because the water wasn't any good, the water wasn't safe. Um, and the only pure drink was, uh, was something that you brewed. Americans celebrated holidays with whiskey, brandies, and punches. They drank liquor to begin and end business negotiations. Workers often stopped at 11 and 4 o'clock for a shot of whiskey. Americans began drinking more whiskey than cider or punch. Drunkenness increased, causing widespread complaints about its association with violence, crime, and family neglect. Temperance was a very important issue for women because it connected to domestic violence. Women experience alcohol um, and heavy alcohol use in men as a source of disruption and danger for them and for their children. He gets angry and she gets hit. And this is a standard pattern that becomes a kind of signature story for the temperance movement. The story is often focused on what happened to the poor wife and child of this guy who got drunk and spent all his wages drinking and then maybe came home drunk and maybe even was violent toward his family. Camp meeting preachers gave congregations an earful about alcohol abuse. Reverend Lyman Beecher and others recommended total abstinence that people not drink at all. Temperance means not using alcohol to excess um, by, in, a, in a definitional way. What it meant socially was taking a pledge of total abstinence from alcohol, not letting a drop touch your lips. Church groups and others formed temperance societies all across the country. Teetotalers swore to never drink alcohol again. Many women and young girls, the most likely victims of violent alcoholics, joined these societies and joined their rallies. The men usually permitted them only to listen rather than speak, but some women spoke out anyway. One way to think of it is that women went public. They wouldn't have been seen on the streets, making speeches, organizing reform societies, or playing a very active role in the church except as worshipers. But now women were assuming public voices, public roles. So we have female societies of all kinds, forming, meeting, distributing pamphlets, taking an active role in their communities. And they become extremely important in all the reform movements of the early 19th century. I revolted in spirit against the customs of society and the laws of the state that crushed my aspirations and debarred me from the pursuit of almost every object worthy of an intelligent, rational mind. Emily Collins. Husband and wife are one, and that one is the husband. William Blackstone Commentaries. What was life like for American women in the early 1800s? As a rule, women could not vote. They had no rights to their property or children, no voice in the laws that governed them. But much depended on where they lived and how much money they had. Out west, women forged trails alongside men, roped cattle, built cabins, hunted for food. Men appreciated their independent spirits because it helped make survival possible in the frontier. These women had more say in local government than most other American women. Farm women had always had more of a say in their communities than urban women had, partly because women had more access to power out west, that they were important pioneers, that they were visible in the society in different ways. They were among the first in the country to win the right to vote in national elections. In the slave south, on the other hand, men ruled. Women remained in traditional roles longer than in other places. Industrial life came slower to the South. Women were less likely to question the social structure. 
In the North, many middle-class women viewed their place as caretaker of the home and family as having religious significance. Women were now supposed to be the ones responsible for retaining some kind of refuge from the rat race, the jungle, the world outside the home, and for instilling morals in young children. Women themselves became the repository of virtue. Women had to create the home. So women had to behave in ways where they could create this moral and virtuous space. They could never look like they were self-seeking. They could never look like they were interested in money. They could never look like any of those things. Dozens of advice books told women how they should dress, behave, decorate their home, and care for their children to please their husbands and God. Dress was uncomfortable, restrictive, and even unhealthy. Women be had become a kind of symbol for the status of the men in their lives. So if you could afford to have a wife who wore a corset, it meant that she didn't have to move around a lot. She didn't have to do any manual labor. She didn't have to clean up after herself. She was a woman of leisure. Of all Americans, African American women, free or slave, had the fewest rights. They were, in fact, defined in a separate category of existence altogether. The racial tensions got greater and greater as the 19th century progressed, and there were always some groups who, of white women who wanted to retain distinctions that gave them more privileges than black women did. As a child growing up in Boston in the 1820s, Elizabeth Cady Stanton loved to ride horses and play hard with her brother. She mastered Greek and studied law in her father's office. Instead of praising her, he only said, Oh, my daughter, I wish you were a boy. When the local boys left for college and careers, she stayed behind to fight with corsets and hairpins. Stanton eventually married an abolitionist and moved to upstate New York, but she never forgot the pain of being excluded. In 1848, she met with Lucretia Mott and Jane Hunt over tea in Waterloo, New York, to plan a women's convention. The Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls was the first time that a group of women and men had gotten together in public to discuss women's rights. They discussed women's grievances about property, access to education and professional careers, and the low status of women in most churches. The right to vote was the most controversial thing they asked for. A right which they complained was given to the most ignorant and degraded men. They wrote a document called the Declaration of Sentiments, using the style and format of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. It was a set of grievances that women had worked over and figured out a set of things they felt they were denied, rights they didn't have, property rights, voting rights, um, and other related rights. And that was the declaration that they issued at the end of the convention. Three years later, Stanton would meet the other great leader of the women's suffrage movement, Susan B. Anthony of Rochester, New York. When she had attempted to speak at a temperance convention, Anthony was told that the ladies had been invited to listen and learn and not to speak. This led Anthony to the cause of women's rights. In 1851, Anthony and Stanton met at an anti-slavery rally and joined forces. Together, women formed associations to fight more effectively for women's rights, challenging everything from restrictive fashions to suffering imprisonment for illegal voting. Women were not allowed to vote. Um, and Anthony challenged this as a property holder and said, I have a right to vote, and actually cast a ballot for which she got cast in jail. We may, with no more propriety, assume to govern women than they might assume to govern us. Samuel May, 1846. Some men joined the cause, while some women scorned it. It was here, in America's outdated and at times inhumane orphanages, insane asylums, and prisons, that American women were leading the crusade to reform the nation.
proceed, gentlemen, briefly to call your attention to the present state of insane persons confined within this commonwealth, in cages, closets, cellars, and pens, chained naked, beaten with rods, and lashed into obedience. Dorothea Dix, 1843. In 1841, Quaker Dorothea Dix was invited to teach Sunday school at the East Cambridge House of Correction. There she found a group of mentally ill women living in a dank, smelly, unheated, and poorly ventilated room. Over the next three years, Dix visited more than 800 prisons, poor houses, and insane asylums in Massachusetts, which she found equally offensive and degrading. Around the country, other men and women began uncovering the sorry state of institutions for the poor, sick, and needy in America. In the 1840s and 50s, reformers revamped and reorganized institutions across the country. The Orphan Society of Philadelphia asked for funds to provide a place where children are sheltered from the perils of want and the contamination of evil example. Caretakers introduced systems of work, learning, and religious instruction. I was informed that it was beautiful to see them pray. For at the first tip of the whistle, they all dropped on their knees. Lydia Child. American prisons in Auburn, New York, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, drew worldwide attention by combining religious instruction with architectural innovations. Keeping its prisoners in solitary confinement, Philadelphia's Eastern State Penitentiary became a major tourist attraction for Europeans who were both fascinated and appalled by its architecture and philosophy of reform. In orphanages, hospitals, and prisons around the country, sanitation improved, educational opportunities increased, and healthy exercise replaced tiny cells. Along with better conditions came strict discipline, regimented days, and religious instruction designed to convert the soul and bring cheerful submission. It seemed that changing the environment really could change people. And if it worked for the poor and needy, why not for others? We are all a little wild here with numberless projects of social reform. Not a reading man has but a draft of a new community in his waistcoat pocket. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Another part of this fascinating period of reform uh, was an impulse to form utopian communities where people would live communally, uh, they would share everything together, um, but they would live in apart from the rest of society and try and perfect themselves. Many hoped to build a perfect society, a utopia. The times were right. Industry was booming, land was cheap and easy to get, and the government allowed many freedoms. Sometimes these were religious societies, sometimes they were secular. The main thing they offered was a refuge from the outside world, from the hustle and bustle of the American city, from the hustle and bustle of factory work, and from the hustle and bustle of increasing commercialism. Scottish businessman Robert Owen came to America in 1824 to set up New Harmony, a socialist utopia in Indiana. Several hundreds of families sharing everything together um, and living men and women separately, celibately, uh, built a, quite a thriving town. But it didn't last very long. These utopias had a way of burning themselves out. More successful were the Shakers, who built communities first in New Lebanon, New York, and then throughout the East and Midwest. The Shaker group stayed small mainly because of their strict requirements. No sex, no marriage, no money, and no private property. Hard work, they believed, was a key to perfection. Up at 4.30 a.m., work and worship filled nearly every minute. You must not lose one moment of time, for you have none to spare. The devil tempts others, but an idle person tempts the devil, Mother Anne Lee. 
In New England, the transcendentalists emphasized the individual over organized religion or the state. They wanted to transcend, to go above the ordinary, to perfect themselves and society. Henry David Thoreau withdrew from family and friends and built a small cabin near Walden Pond. He believed that bustling cities took people away from nature and that government interfered with freedom. There will never be a really free and enlightened state until the state comes to recognize the individual as a higher and independent power. Henry David Thoreau. By the late 1840s, Thoreau put forth his concept of civil disobedience, the individual's right to disobey unjust laws. It was a concept shared by many. Some transcendentalists actively helped slaves escape, arguing that slavery was against God's law and crushed the human spirit. More and more Americans were disgusted with slavery. But how could they fight the powerful southern states that depended on slave labor to keep their economy growing? The whole commerce between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most boisterous passions, the most unremitting despotism on the one part, and degrading submissions on the other. Our children see this and learn to imitate it. Thomas Jefferson, 1835. Letters and diaries from the late 1700s and early 1800s contain guilt-ridden passages about slavery. Of all the reform movements in the first half of the 19th century, the most important and the most divisive was anti-slavery, abolitionism, uh, the move to eradicate slavery from American life. But masters desiring to free their slaves faced a real problem, for few white Americans believed that the races could live together. What then should be the fate of freed slaves? In the 1820s, the American Colonization Society um, took the position, had long taken the position, that um, the solution to the so-called race problem of the day was to collect um, African Americans together and ship them back to their homeland in Africa. They bought a tract of land, now called Liberia, and named its capital Monrovia, after President Monroe. Fewer than 15,000 African Americans actually went to Liberia. Others went to Haiti. But colonization was clearly not the answer. In 1831, William Lloyd Garrison began publishing The Liberator, which called for an immediate end to slavery. Uncompromising in his opposition to slavery, Garrison once burned the Constitution. William Lloyd Garrison, a Boston abolitionist, called the Constitution a covenant with death, an agreement with hell tells you something about the strong language that he would describe the Constitution which protected slavery in those terms. So it was very divisive, but of course it was very important because until slavery was eradicated there would never be peace in America. Being anti-slavery didn't necessarily mean being anti-racist. Some abolitionists spoke about African Americans as children who needed protection. They would allow civil and religious freedoms, but not social equality, and especially not interracial marriages. Men and women who had lived in slavery, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, proved to be some of the most effective abolitionists. The most telling, the most killing refutation of slavery is the presentation of an industrious, enterprising, thrifty, and intelligent black population. Frederick Douglass, 1853. Women found themselves in the public eye for their efforts. Under a law designed to keep slaves from learning how to read the anti-slavery pamphlets sent south by northern abolitionists, women were fired and jailed for teaching African-American children to read in Virginia. Harriet Tubman carried a $40,000 bounty on her head for leading slaves north to freedom through the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman had been born into slavery. She was married to a man who was not a slave. She wanted to leave the, uh, the territory. She wanted her own freedom. And she couldn't convince him to go with her. 
and she went anyway and she wound up crossing the state line by herself having left him behind completely on her own at the same time feeling that she had been in a sense reborn by now being a free person and being determined to do what she could to free first her family and then whoever else she could bring out and she went back to the south over and over again putting herself in danger of being recaptured our mails were clogged with abolition pamphlets and inflammatory documents to be distributed among our southern negroes to induce them to cut our throats J. Baker, 1853. People who were for reformers were interested in women's rights, they were interested in temperance, uh, movement to abolish alcohol, etc., etc. Increasingly, increasingly, these people became preoccupied with one issue, and that was slavery. In so many areas, Americans, men and women, blacks and whites, appeared to be moving toward the ideals the nation was founded on the essential dignity and equality of all human beings and the inalienable rights to freedom, justice and opportunity. The flurry of reform activity changed life for many Americans but heaven never came to earth. The struggle over slavery would split the nation in two and bring America to war.